Most people can recognise serious overgrazing when they see it. But dramatic examples like these don't happen overnight. They start with subtle changes in the landscape. Overgrazing occurs at different scales, ranging right from the individual plant level to different individual plants within a patch, and then also different land types within the broader landscape. Animals are really good at selecting a highly nutritious and digestible diet when they're given the choice. For example, animals will always select the green leaf over the stem because the leaves are a lot more nutritious and they're also more digestible. And then you have plants that are more palatable than other plants. And individual plants sometimes have defences against grazing, things like prickles or even chemical deterrents. And then at the landscape scale, you have instances where animals prefer certain land types and that might be because of the pasture plants that are present but also other things that animals need like shade or water and then other areas of the landscape attract animals uh, when things like there's been fires or recent rainfall. Selective grazing is actually a desirable thing when it comes to animal production because when given the choice animals choose the most nutritious diet possible from what's on offer and when they're able to do that, that helps them with their individual animal production. But when left unmanaged, that selective grazing means that some plants are grazed over and over and over again. And when that happens, those plants can become weakened and they die. So selective grazing really has to be managed in order to manage your pastures. Green leaves capture sunlight energy and turn this into chemical energy via the process of photosynthesis. This energy is used to grow more leaves, stems and roots. When there isn't enough green leaf to meet all the energy needs of the plant, the plant draws on energy that has been stored in the roots until there is enough green leaf to take over. If the plant has to keep drawing on root reserves, the roots shrink and the plant can be easily pulled out of the ground or die. The best thing you can do is really become familiar with the different plants that are in your pasture so that you can tell the difference between palatable plants and unpalatable plants. Once you know which are the plants that are highly palatable, you can look for those in the pasture and see how much grazing pressure is being applied to them. We can look at stubble height as an indicator of the grazing pressure that they're sustaining. And on palatable individuals, a stubble height of about 10 to 15 centimetres after the graze period is the ideal target. You don't really want to graze them below that. The other thing that we like to monitor is the amount of bare ground. In the far north, during the wet season, we like to see ground cover levels of 50% or higher. It's quite hard to actually get that high level of cover in more arid areas. And so the best way to monitor bare ground in arid areas is just to ensure that you're sort of holding steady in most seasons and that bare ground levels aren't increasing dramatically over time. In the far northern parts of Australia, burning is often used as a management tool on properties and it can be used to manage patch grazing. So patch grazing is where you have plants that have been heavily grazed during the growing season but they're next to other plants that weren't grazed and they've become tall and rank. One way of managing this patchiness in the landscape is to put a fire through either just before the wet season or after the first rains of the wet season. And this resets the pastures back to a blank canvas. And then when they regrow, they all grow up at the same rate with the same level of nutrition. And that basically eliminates that patch grazing from the season before. One way of managing overgrazing is to be very careful about your placement of new infrastructure. So if you're putting in a new water point, for example, try not to locate that water point on really sensitive or highly preferred country. If possible, try and site your water point away from those areas so the cattle actually have to walk out to them. Because if the water point is right there, the grazing pressure will be very high and it will be high for long sustained periods. Fencing is a great way of controlling cattle access to certain areas of the landscape. By fencing out creeks and rivers where you can, you actually can control the amount of grazing that occurs in those highly preferred areas. 
One of the best things you can do to manage this perpetual grazing on preferred plants is to actually just release the grazing pressure from them. And the way we do this is by pasture spelling. Pasture spelling is the removal of animals from the pasture for periods of time, preferably during the growing season. And this allows those plants that have been under sustained grazing pressure to recover and they can grow bigger, get bigger root systems and they can also produce seed. So a great way of just tracking of what's going on in the landscape and how grazing is influencing your pastures is to take photos at the same location over time. Because our memories aren't always as good as we think they are, photographs over time are a really good way of seeing how your pastures are travelling and also to see whether those areas of bare ground are expanding over time. And then over time, through different years, you'll see seasonal changes, but you'll also be able to detect changes caused by selective grazing. A really great way of getting some skill development in grazing management is to attend a one-day grazing fundamentals workshop in your local area. And for more advanced training in grazing land management, a three-day grazing land management workshop is also a great investment. For help or advice on identifying and managing overgrazing, contact your local grazing extension officer or visit the Future Beef website.